Thank you everyone for coming to our events. Um, it should be an interesting discussion. Uh, Liberate the Debate, who's um, hosting this, is a society formed in order to provide a place for people with differing points of view to come together to discuss and debate construct in a constructive and civil manner. Um, often those who disagree are set at polar opposites. When in reality, there are some commonalities that can be found and discussion is more productive and listening is important to progress. Um, tonight event, Tonight's event is Sex War, a discussion. Uh, we have two men's rights activists and two feminists who will explore the commonalities and differences between the two movements. So I'd like to introduce you to the panellists. We've got um, two men's rights activists, Elizabeth Hobson and William Costello. Elizabeth is an anti-feminist gender equality activist, libertarian and individualist. William is Birmingham-based with a background in career guidance, education, consultancy, and journalism. And our feminists are Elizabeth Holden and Jordan Stevens. Elizabeth is a Peruvian American lawyer currently living in the UK and has pre previously she's worked on campaigns for the Democratic Party in America. And Jordan Stevens is a writer and performer best known for being one half of Rizzle Kicks. And his mental health campaign, I Am Whole, made a big impact being mentioned in the Houses of Parliament. And he's also written an article in The Guardian on the negative effects of hypermasculinity on men's well-being. So I'd ask the audience to be respectful um, during the speakers' sections, because um, um, there will be a time for the audience to ask questions, don't worry. Um, each panellist will have sort of five to six minutes to speak. Um, following that, I'll have some questions for them, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So... Um, and if everyone could turn their phones off and turn phones on silent so that it doesn't interfere with the filming and just if you didn't see the sign on the way in this event is being filmed just for everyone's knowledge so um, we'll begin with Elizabeth the feminist Elizabeth um, if you'd like to go ahead so free speech has helped move mountains for women's rights especially in the last hundred years in Western culture in non-Western culture, free speech is only now just becoming available to women. Women are literally being imprisoned in Iran for refusing to wear the kneecap, and when a female lawyer dares to stand up, she's sent sentenced to 38 years in prison. In Saudi Arabia, women silently got the right to drive, but only as a point of utility, and only with approval of their respective husbands and fathers. Now let's first focus on Western culture. How has free speech helped advance women's rights? Thank a feminist if you'd like the right to vote. The suffragettes took to the streets and used their voices, and women were able to obtain the right to vote in a world that saw them as non-citizens. Their struggle was not without casualties, and the fem famous Emmeline Pankhurst said that women had to do the work themselves, and their motto was deeds, not words. Women had to take radical steps for their fundamental human right to vote. They stormed parliament, they set fire to property, and battled against the police. But who here could argue that their cause was not a worthy one? At the time, they were imprisoned and ridiculed and by, by the media and killed. But through their bravery and civil disobedience, women now have the right to vote. That would not have been possible without free speech, even if that was stifled by the state when their voice was heard. In the 1960s and 70s, women used their voices to campaign for reproductive rights a sexual revolution and an autonomy over one's body. They took to the streets at a time that it was a perfect storm for change in the backdrop of the civil rights movement. Women burned their bras and, and the advent of television saw women have their voices heard on a mass scale. Gloria Steinem went undercover as a playboy bunny and challenged prevailing attitudes towards sex and argued that a sexual revolution at the time would only emancipate a generation if women played a role in defining it. The end result was that women got the right to choose in Roe v. Wade, access to contraception, and freedom in terms of sexual expression and sexuality. Women's role in society was challenged from just being a mother to a professional, and gender roles became questioned. Now fast forward to today. Me Too and Time's Up has given a voice to women who have previously been too afraid to speak up against sexual ha harassment and rape. The, this time, free speech centered around justice, or rather, injustice. In 2010, studies showed that in the US, one in five women have been the victim of sexual assault, while only 0.1% of those victims reported the crime. It goes without saying that sex crimes such as rape until now have been de facto difficult to prove 
due in part to the stigma surrounding female sexuality. But with Me Too, prominent celebrities such as Rose McGowan took a brave stand against their perpetrators, which gave courage to other women to come forward about, uh, and bring about justice. This time there was power in numbers and unsurmountable evidence came forward evidencing the undeniable crimes of prominent men who had long been allowed to skate by, such as Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein. Free speech challenged the norm that it was okay to treat women in this way in the workplace. The Me Too movement is not only limited to female victims, as we've seen the victims of Kevin Spacey come forward. I think it's also important to note that the progress of women's freedom of expression in respect of sexuality and desire. While male desire has long been an accepted part of society that literally shapes how women can behave, think rape culture, the hijab, and boys will be boys. Female desire is something that is still so shunned. Women's a female form literally has to be hidden because men can't control themselves. But women who vocalize what turns them on face rampant online abuse and slut shaming. So where are we today? The numbers tell a story. 190 heads of state, nine are women. Of all the people in parliament in the world, 9% are women. The corporate sector, only 6.4% of CEOs in the companies that make up the Fortune 500 list are women. That's actually down 25% from 2017. So women still face harder choices between professional success and personal fulfillment. Women in the US do not have any statutory maternity leave, paid or otherwise. And in many right to work states, many uh, where employers do not have to give a woman, or do not have to give anyone uh, a reason for firing an employee, a woman can literally be fired for just being pregnant. Women's reproductive rights have been constantly under threat, with Donald Trump stating that he intends to overturn Roe v. Wade, and women in Northern Ireland had, do not have access to abortions. Just last month, an 11-year-old girl in Argentina was denied an abortion when she was the victim of rape and incest by her grandmother's boyfriend, and judges denied her application due to conscientious objections. The baby subsequently died because clearly an 11-year-old body cannot and should not be forced to carry to term a baby. Here in the UK, it has only just been ruled that menstrual health should be taught to young girls in schools, but that won't be implemented until 2020. Over 1,500 girls in Rotherham alone were the victim of grooming gangs, and only one case of FGM has ever been prosecuted. And where there was over 4,000, even though there was over 4,000 cases of FGM in 2017 alone, women are sold as sex slaves through forced marriages from the UK to the Middle East, and their rights are limited by their families. Um, clearly, there's a lot of work for women's rights, even in the West, and free speech has not been afforded to all women. So, is this a result of a sex war? No. There are plenty of women oppressing other women, and there are women that victimize, when, victimize men. This is a societal issue. We live in a society that internalizes misogyny, uh, which also affects men who are told to behave in a certain way. Just as my colleague here will bring up that there are plenty of issues facing men today, uh, there are issues facing women today. I would stand up against the injustices faced against men in the family court system just as much as I would stand up for women who are the victim of rape. We should stand up against injustice in all its forms, but just as the male victim of domestic violence is not given a platform, that 11-year-old uh, girl was not given a platform in Argentina. We have to work together to address the issues that each gender are facing. This is not adversarial. I'm a feminist, but I'm also a men's rights activist, and I invite everyone in the audience to be both. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now head over to our other side of the panel with William. Thank you. If there is a sex war, I feel it's perpetuated primarily by feminists who frame all of human history as male to female oppression only. To quote Camille Paglia, history must be seen clearly and fairly. Obstructive traditions arose not from men's hatred or enslavement of women, but from the natural division of labor that had developed over thousands of years and once immensely benefited and protected women, permitting them to care for helpless infants while men risked their lives in dangerous jobs or at war. The main issues I have with feminism are as follows. The way it defines power primarily as economic success and demeans motherhood. 
It perpetually views women as oppressed and victimized and doesn't acknowledge any female privilege. It strips women of agency and considers that it is men who are responsible for all the disadvantages they face. All disadvantages that men face also happen to be entirely men's fault. Through the lens of feminism, power is often only seen as economic success, but when you define power as control over one's own life, the idea of a patriarchy falls to pieces. Upon entering the labour market, women can now choose to be fully career-driven, work part-time, or be a stay-at-home mother. This is not a choice afforded to men. Men have an obligation for success that is largely driven by female mate selection and the concept of hypergamy, whereby women in general select for men who are of equal or higher earning power. To illustrate this point, I'll use my own personal experience. I would love nothing more than to be a stay-at-home dad. I think it's a shame that more fathers don't take a more balanced approach to parenting and career. However, I could not choose to do this without first achieving a high level of economic success. This pressure is not felt because of any toxic masculinity or macho sense of competition with other men. It's felt because I know that I would have little to no value in a mating market if I, were if I chose to be a stay-at-home dad or even work part-time. I know that women just would not choose me. What woman would want a deadbeat dad who cannot provide? Men, in my experience, tend to follow the reward system, whether consciously felt or on a sub subterranean level, I believe the pressure to pass your genes into the next generation to be the only game in town in terms of driving our psychological behavior. Women are excelling in the economic market at a brilliant pace as we've moved from a brawn-based economy to a brain-based economy. They are rapidly outpacing men in education, but valuing a university degree in prospective partners more than ever. This supply and demand mismatch is not good news for anyone, least of all women, who require and desire competent partners. The gender pay gap is a myth, as up until the age of 30, women actually out-earn men and are doing extremely well in their careers. This is a success that is never highlighted within feminism, as it does not fit the narrative of women being oppressed. What exists is a mother and non-mother pay gap. This is inevitable, as any man that needed to exit the workplace between the ages of 30 to 35 would also suffer a earning power penalty too. I have heard some feminists say that they would be open to marrying a stay-at-home dad, primarily because it might free them up to thrive in their own careers. I say, do it. Change the reward system and watch male behaviour change in, in, as such. Let's move beyond role mates and move towards being soulmates. However, as long as the status hierarchy is organized around economic success, as long as the men who do not achieve economic success are dismissed as potential partners by women, you will see men maniacally drive to get to the top in their careers, even to the detriment of the relationships in their lives. Women are not under pressure to do this and are free to make smarter choices that lead to a more balanced and fulfilled life. I feel that these decisions are often demeaned by feminists who see economic success as the only prism through which to view power. In my experience as a careers advisor, I have often encountered female students who feel that they cannot vocalize a desire to work part-time or to choose motherhood over career. They also express a bemusement at the pointed efforts in education to try and tramline them into STEM career paths. I am routinely told that the textbook definition is that feminism is nothing more than the belief of equality between the sexes. I am told that if I believe in this, then congratulations, I'm now a feminist. I find this insistence quite arrogant. I reject this definition because it's not what I see played out in the world by most feminists. Believing in equal rights makes me an egalitarian, not a gynocentric focused feminist. I am in good company, however, as in a study by feminist organization, the Fawcett Society, it revealed that 91% of women do not identify as a feminist. One would think that this revelation would cause feminist organizations to pause for thought and consider whether they really represent women or whether they are living up to their mission statement of equality. Their response was to claim that most women simply just don't know that they're really feminists. In other words, they think that most women are too thick to think for themselves. Equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. It matters whether this definition means equality of opportunity or equality of outcome. Feminism tends to be more focused on the latter, often calling for quotas that are, in my view, demeaning to women and suggestive that they cannot succeed in a meritocracy. 
To achieve equality of outcome, we must, by virtue, engineer discrimination against some group based on immutable characteristics. We can have equality of outcome, or we can have freedom, not both. Feminists don't seem to want to talk about equality in every area, however, such as suicide, prison representation, prison sentencing, and homelessness. My own partner has bravely, bravely spoke at men's rights activist events and other debates around gender politics. She insists that this discussion is not adversarial, and she shares my belief that when one sex loses, both sexes lose. I certainly wish all feminists took her attitude, but that has not been my experience. I ask my interlocutors tonight, if it's not adversarial, will you call out the feminists when articles are written such as, why can't we hate men? Or when Radio 4 guest editor and feminist Chidera Agura writes that other people's feminism could involve making the world a better place for men, but she doesn't have time to think about it. If men are committing suicide because they can't cry, how is it any of my concern? These are not fringe troll commenters online. These are mainstream voices within our cultural discourse. We hear lots about toxic masculinity, to the point where even the American Psychological Association attempts to pathologize traditionally masculine behaviors in their guidelines. We routinely see the worst examples of male behavior used to be emblematic of masculinity in general. For example, the Gillette toxic masculinity ad. This ad really annoyed me because, in my opinion, it could have been perfect and was really close. If it detailed the many examples of poor male behavior and said, men, we know this is not you, and that this is not masculinity, it would be close to perfect. Because the truth is, it's not. Feminism does women a disservice to train them to think of men as generally dangerous rapists. They are more generally the fathers, brothers, and partners who love them. An ad detailing the worst of female behavior and then asking women to do better would never have any currency. Why is that? To defend the ad, one has to defend the notion that it is fair to categorize men based on the actions of a small minority of the worst behaved individuals. That is prejudice. Why is there never a discussion about the many ways in which there is female privilege or toxic feminism? There is no room for this discussion within feminism. I think that if we are to move beyond the polarizing and tribal discussion, it will be done through free speech and sharing these spaces for dialogue. I believe that despite many disagreements, my partner did much to change hearts and minds about the intent of some feminists by engaging in dialogue with MRAs and being open to understanding genuine grievance. She was even acknowledged in an MRA blog on International Women's Day for this very fact. It is testament to her that prolific men's rights activist Mike Buchanan, who has been on the vanguard of gender equality rights for decades, even commented that she was the first feminist he had ever heard speak out against the barbarism of male genital mutilation. If these conversations are to prove successful, we need to move beyond the label of feminism and unite under the common goal of egalitarianism that has room to discuss the genuine grievances both men and women face. I conclude with a quote from Eric Anderson, that feminism needs a new wave. A wave goodbye. Thank you for that. Um, next up, Jordan, your turn. Uh, am I allowed to reference what he just said? Uh, if you want to use your time for that, it's, it's up to so you. So I've got five use. minutes. Yeah, I'm, five, I'm, six I'm minutes. I'm a bit of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got a very good... Yeah. Talk until you... Yeah. Yeah? I'm on a timer time. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so uh, what feminism means to me. Um, I personally believe that uh, masculinity and femininity are energies and are too often attached to gender. Um, and it is of my belief that the traits that one um, attaches to femininity are imperative to the survival of a lot of men and to the balance of, of every human being. Um, I know from the, the having spoken out about my own issues with uh, emotion and expressing emotion that that's not a stretch for me to consider that a difficulty for, for men on, on the entire planet. Um, and the truth of the matter is the emotional world isn't optional. Um, people pretend like it is. I know some people are advocates for stoicism or other techniques, but it doesn't go away. Trauma is a physical reality that lives within you and manifests through behavior, illness, um, decision making. It, it needs to be processed. Uh, I watched a documentary called The Work, which was uh, in a high security prison. Um, where a group of inmates who are in there for, I don't know, 20 to 
50 years, maybe longer, basically did childhood trauma work and all realized that the basis of their anger was like one piece of rejection when they were like six years old by their father, um, feeling insignificant, not having a place to express themselves. Uh, I, I really, I really very much believe that masculinity, like femininity, is imperative to every human being, and there are countless examples of, of spaces where masculinity is, is, is balanced effectively and, and brought our entire species forward, but I mean, on the way here I've heard about like two other guys just like shooting people up, um, there was like an honour killing in Utrecht about two hours ago, uh, there was obviously a mass shooting yesterday. Um, I think one mass shooting has been uh, has been has happened as a result of a, a female. I think it was a girl. She shot like one girl in school. Most school killings are little boys um, who have been rejected, who feel disenfranchised, and decide to shoot everyone. Um, I'm not really into that. <laughs> I, I'm firmly I firmly believe that we can change that. I'm not really up for accepting that as a way of being. Um, I believe that. We have existed to a certain extent for this long with a set amount of rules and boundaries, but very much like our technology and like everything else in our life, we're evolving and changing and there's space for development. Um, misogyny, unconscious misogyny is a real, real issue in our culture and it's a coping mechanism from what I understand for a lot of men, which leads to things like domestic abuse, leads to rape culture, leads to issues around consent and um, respecting women, if that's considered to be a feminine attribute, I don't know, I actually think it's masculine too. But I think that if we can change a culture that doesn't, with our vocabulary, discriminate against femininity, um, with words like pussy, gay, homophobia is still massive, I can't believe homophobia is still a thing for such a supposedly intelligent species. Um, you just have to look at the animal king. I don't know, it's just it's bizarre to me. But that is another form of, of, of misogyny. Anything associated with femininity seems terrifying to a, to, I'd say, a man. Um, so yeah, so my, my basic belief in it is, is actually more in the energy itself. I think patriarchy as a term is up for contention, but I believe that it you know, stems from uh, paternity, from, from you know, the, 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 the father being the head of the household. Um, from that, you can gather that it, it was started to really take force when the man realized that it was their sperm that could create a child and it was their heir that could take on power. And thus you end up with a lot of sexual shaming and um, the kind of sexual suppression of women. And that continued as a form of control. Um, and again, that's something I stand against. I don't think that really makes any sense. Um, but I don't think patriarchy is specific to a gender either. I think that a lot of us are passing the, these lessons down to our children. I don't, by any stretch of the imagination, think that women are flawless. Um, I, I think everyone is, is, has an individual battle. But there's definitely a system in place that, that I say, I'd say even punishes, punishes uh, displays of feminism in various ways. I think that needs to shift. And that goes for men and women. I know, there's, I know that there's plenty of um, mums out there who, who definitely have quite a, uh, I'd say, hyper-masculine way of handling things. Um, and I'd say the same thing to them. I think generally we all have a responsibility to ourselves to develop the parts inside of us that are more in touch with our emotional world um, because that's really what it means to be a human being is to connect to people. It's not to climb an economic tree and earn a load of money so you can, I don't know, caught someone or it's not um, it's not accumulation because you can read this online a lot of people's regrets on their deathbed is that they didn't spend more time being a fucking human and spent too much time earning something that's literally conceptual and means fuck all so if I'm going to get more extreme as well I've got any time I actually want to go to more extreme got that a minute oh sweet <laughs> alright so that's my normal that's, I'm going to stop there that's like my rough idea I also I'm just going to put this up because I was thinking this earlier fuck it um I wonder actually if this push, this desire for there to be voices heard in the realms of feminism is actually some kind of attempt to balance the entire species because from the rate we're going and our reliance on intellectuality, it seems that we are literally creating our own demise constantly in the world um, because our priorities seem to be with accumulation and competition and domination rather than 
the safety and benefit of everyone and actually our species. So I kind of think for that reason, feminism is a revolutionary act. Thank you. Now over to Elizabeth, our final sort of panellist. Hi, uh, so I am an anti-feminist gender equality activist and you can call me an MRA. It's my contention that the sex war is a feminist invention that pits women's equality against that of men in a toxic zero-sum game that's entirely distanced from what the majority of people who don't identify as feminist actually want. If you look at history clear-eyed and with love in your heart, what you find is that history is a story of collaborative effort by men and women united in the cause of conservation of what's good and progress towards what's better. Of course, there's been disadvantage and injustice. However, it's historically affected men and women in fairly equal measure. So much of it has been ameliorated by men and working hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder. And contrary to what feminists will insist, in this society today, the sex demographic suffering the lion's share of disadvantage and injustice is not female. From the seminal text of the first wave, the Declaration of Sentiments from Seneca Falls, feminism has shown itself to be a grievance movement that myopically focuses on women's experiences and campaigns for privileges on our behalf. Regardless of whether such privileges are moral or just, regardless of whether they drive a wedge between the sexes, and regardless of whether or not the majority of women even want to see men and boys disadvantaged, because you can't privilege one sex without disadvantaging the other. With the second wave, feminism really underscored the fact that not only was it a movement seeking to privilege women, but that in order to achieve that aim, it was going to foster hatred towards men. Third wave feminism is distinct for its inclusion of people of colour and their experiences, and that's a positive development. What's a shame, however, is that third wave feminists can't examine the susceptibility of their movement to being blind to, minimising or even showing hostility towards the sexism that affects certain demographics, and realise that that's exactly what the feminist movement has always and continues to this day, to display towards men and male disadvantage. In the interests of nuance, I accept that there have been and are individuals, like over the road over there, um, who identify as feminists who don't fit into the negative description that I've just given. There are feminists who want equal rights for men and women, equal treatment, choices, opportunities. Feminists who have compassion for men and value them. But, what impact have they really had on the trajectory and achievements of the movement? They've been marginalized heretics, pleading intelligently and rationally, but essentially ineffectually with their hysterical peers. While their hysterical peers have been lobbying our institutions irresponsibly and illogically, but consistently successfully for policies and procedures that are damaging our societies. Weaponizing the human instinct of gynocentrism, that's the tendency to center the needs and wants of women, feminism as a rule is inherently regressive. The men's rights movement, on the other hand, is a genuinely progressive movement. While our representatives tend to have gratitude for the traditional structures that have brought us so far, and want to see candid discourse on the reality that research consistently shows that traditional setups work for many people, thus enabling individuals to make informed life choices, we seek an end to the archaic, gynocentric culture that privileges women at the expense of men in law and the administration of it. Not by smashing our societies, but by building on the fantastic values like liberty and equality that are enshrined with, within them. I realize that to achieve the kind of society that I want, I will exist alongside feminists. But feminists need to understand that they will have to move over and allow the non-feminist majority, including the likes of me and William, to take our rightful places in our institutions without intimidation 
and they're going to have to stop lying. I know the two feminists sitting here with me today are good people, and I would like to know if and how they're going to drag the movement they align themselves with out of the dark ages. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to our first question. My first question is directed towards men's rights activists, but then after their answers, if, you've, if um, the other side have anything to comment on that specific question, um, please let me know, and we'll go on to you afterwards. So first of all, I'd like to ask, so feminism has also highlighted the issues that have affected men um, in regard to gender stereotyping. Um, so why do you think that the feminist movement is detrimental to men? Okay, so the feminist movement campaigns for disadvantages and discrimination against men, for example, in quota systems, in the criminal justice system, in family courts. And a friend of mine, John Waters, came up with a great simile for how they then treat men in our society. He said, it's like being mugged in the street and the mugger comes and he beats the hell out of you. And every so often he stops to say, you're right. So that's what I think about the feminist concern for rigid gender roles affecting men. Um, I don't see how feminism has done anything to highlight men's issues. I see that feminism, a core tenant of it, is to reinforce the notion that it is men who are privileged in today's world. And that's just not the world I see. Uh, the truth is that men and women are disadvantaged in different ways. Uh, the dictionary definition just doesn't play out in the real world. We're consistently told that men need to talk about their feelings more, uh, but yet men's rights activists are lampooned as whiny crybabies, and being a white male is seen as automatic privilege and somehow even a slur word. I think feminism has stereotyped men indeed uh, as privileged and tyrannical oppressors only. I mean, uh, even MPs literally laugh when you bring up the notion that there are areas that men might be disadvantaged. So that, that shows you the level with which you can lampoon men's issues from the guys of feminism. Thank you, guys. Any comment on that question? Yeah. Uh, male suicide reduced in 2017. Um, it's still really high and it's still shared significantly by men, but I feel as though there was kind of a cultural shift around that time and it was spurred by feminism and it was for men to be a little bit more open to speak. Uh, so just in regards to that part of the question, I really do believe that a push for equality has, has triggered at the very least conversation. Also, just to go back to your earlier point, I'm pretty sure the Gillette advert was saying that that was a good form of masculinity that they appreciated. It's the best a man can be. It's not the best a man hasn't ever been yet. It does matter because because that is the same by definition. The best a man can be, i.e., that is their idea of what an amazing man is. Um, what was the original question? Was do you think that it was um, sort of if feminism has highlighted the issues for men? So what what has the feminist movement done for men? So yeah, I, I genuinely I genuinely believe that, um, like I said before, there needs to be a space where men are held accountable for emotional negligence, which happens at all levels. We're looking at a, a time right now where we have a bunch of kind of like fatherless kids running around, not really knowing what to do with themselves. That is something, that's an example of what happens in the absence of masculinity. I know that's used as a pro men's rights point, but similarly, where's the dad? Um, I think there needs to be an appreciation of, of how important it is to be there as a father. And I do think that that it has more, more aligned, seems to be more aligned with feminism than it does with anything else, but I, I, I don't know. Um, feminism has helped me personally because um, I think the idea that there is any imbalance or there's any second class gender is really, really dangerous for the person who considers that. And um, finding a space where I am conscious of the people around me and understanding about consent, responsibility and honour has done wonders for me and wonders for the guys around me. Um, so I do think that feminism is positive for me. Thanks. Elizabeth? Yeah, so feminism uh, wants to bring light to issues about gender stereotyping, not only for women, but also for men. It's 
detrimental to say that all women should stay at home, just as it is to say that all men should be the sole breadwinners. So challenging those gender roles can actually help men. So it would help men be perhaps stay-at-home fathers and have relationships with their children. Uh, but unfortunately, we still live in a society where those male gender roles are not being challenged. You just look at Jacob Rees-Mogg in 2017 saying that he never changed a diaper in his life and he has six children. Uh, he went on to say that he made no pretense that he's a modern man but he's probably as modern as you. Uh, Mog justified his actions by saying that most of society is just like him. So women are, are responsible, it just shows that women are responsible for most of the non-paid work in the home, um, which takes a toll on their career and, um, and their work-life balance. Uh, they are responsible for 60% more of the housework than their male partners. So w wouldn't it be a good thing if we challenged those gender roles and, and brought men into the household? I think that it would br bring down suicide rights even further. Um, and we should normalize men's participation in the home. Um, if a man changes a diaper, it, it shouldn't be as a treat to the woman. It should be uh, expected. Um, uh, perhaps that would bring balance and uh, men would have a greater access to their children, which is what um, my, the men's rights activists are desperately wanting, uh, and perhaps bring better mental health to, uh, to men and lower suicide rates. Thank you. Um, so the next question is sort of targeted towards the feminist side, but obviously afterwards I'll go back to our other panellists. So this is, do you agree with positive discrimination and does it unfairly disadvantage men? Um, so if so, like quote, so say if women will get a job, if they're looking for to fulfil a quota and they'd um, put a woman there. Um, so like the Labour Party have... Um, women or women shortlists, so they'll just have the one constituency have all women candidates for um, to become an MP. Shit, I'm supposed to prepare for this. <laughs> um, well, I could start it off. Long. Yeah, yeah, do, do, do. All right, no problem. So actually, studies. Well, <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> studies have shown that uh, companies that have more diverse boards actually perform better. So uh, a recent Australian study reported that companies with a gender diverse board delivered seven percent more higher returns than investors with companies uh, than companies with no women at all. Um, Countries that have um, that where women have more access to the workplace have higher GDP, have higher wages, and higher productivity. But unfortunately, we've seen that there are still barriers for women entering the workforce or maintaining the workforce. As my uh, and my opponents would say, that the gender pay gap oftentimes ends up being a mother non mother pay gap. Women are not paid when they return to the workforce. So. Obviously, it makes uh, uh, women uh, achieving certain levels of their profession very difficult. So it is a good way for encouraging those women to re stay in the workforce by allowing, having, uh, by pro providing quotas. Um, but it doesn't start there. Uh, it starts much earlier. It starts with gender roles. Um, it's it, uh, so. Um, it's not traditional for a woman to be a computer engineer or a pilot. Um, so perhaps uh, we should be uh, we should not be giving girls toys that are vacuum cleaners. We should be giving them planes. This would perhaps in turn allow women from a very young age to strive to, for those professions. It would be too late if we're offering those incentives when they're reaching university age. We should be offering those incentives much much younger. Um, I don't, I'm not sure actually, it's, in my head, it's not so much positive discrimination as, as an awareness of unconscious bias, I think. Because if I, if I, you know, I've kind of been raised in a world where sometimes it's, it even feels like a natural step to say him or he in certain circles. It's, it's like almost reactive to just prioritize the male sex. Um, so I don't think it's so much like two, two people going for the same job with the same skills but the man being discriminated against. I think it's that there's been a, a, a years of a society where there will be 
unconscious barriers to stop a woman from getting there in the first place. So I, and also, it, it also insinuates that the women wouldn't be as qualified, if not more. I think the aware, an, an awareness that there's a disproportionate amount of people in a workplace, I think, is really important because um, there are all types of things that that there are all types of reasons, environmental and economical, that can end up with someone being shut out of something, you know, and that goes, that's the same with race, you know, there's still reports that you're less, you're less likely to get a job if your name's African, do you know what I mean? Like, that, I wouldn't think that would be positive discrimination to pay attention to African applicants, that would be like just not being a dickhead. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, so in, in, that, in that respect, um, I'm definitely for Thank you. Um, have you got any comments on that one? Uh, yeah, I just want to focus in on the ways in which we agree. I think that any workforce is absolutely benefited by the best men and the best women, the best person for the role. So by your own definition, you're against quotas because it's demeaning to both men and women to say by virtue of you just happening to be a man or a woman, you're going to be in this position. And it's demeaning to the role itself, actually. Uh, any workforce that would disclude any group of people by virtue of an immutable characteristic, that's disadvantaging itself. Um, I believe women are brilliant, competent, and capable of succeeding in any meritocracy. I don't think a 50-50 quota uh, does women or men any good. You want the best women there on merit. I thought feminism was about empowerment, not moving goalposts, and I want any daughters I'm lucky enough to have to believe that they can get to any role that they want to get to by virtue of them being brilliant, rather than they just happen to be a woman to fill a quota. Yeah. Can I respond to that? Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, like, if you were to take into consideration um, something practical like uh, the world of film, mm -hmm. there is definitely an unconscious discrimination in regard to that, in regards to what stories get told, what films get made, and um, the fairness around that. In the last like year or two, there have been two British writers, particularly um, female, who are incredible, like genuinely incredible writers, and the, the, the stories that have been shown on screen just haven't been around. Like the male gaze has been so dominant in forming the ideas of young boys and girls, of how they perceive themselves, the storylines, they're all very Hollywood for what it felt like at the start of my life was very samey. So I just ask, what is that in that situation? Because there are incredible female DOPs, incredible female grips, incredible female directors, writers, who were never given an opportunity because, I don't know, nepotism, because of bias, because not being taken seriously. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What do, what, in that situation, I don't think that's based off of an, a fair evaluation. I think it's based off of power-hungry people being rude and greedy. But, well, you might be right, and we might agree with challenging any stereotypes that find from both men and women, but what you're talking about is an unquantifiable stereotype being rectified by a quantifiable discrimination. Right. And that's what we're against. What do you mean an unquantifiable stereotype? Well, if you have a... a, a what you're saying if how many women didn't get into film because of stereotypes about what that meant, mm. and were not considered... That's unquantifiable. You're taken seriously. Yeah, but that's unquantifiable. What you're suggesting as uh, if a quota is your solution to that, that's it's a quantifiable, quantifiable, it's quantifiable discrimination. In the statistics. It's quantifiable in how many men wrote and directed films and how many women did. That's very quantifiable. No, because that's a multivaried problem that could call, call into choice. But if there's, half, if, there's, if, there's, if there's half the world is men and half the world is women, then why is that not represented in film? Because the world isn't... The world is not based on equality of outcome. Do, do you think that the best yeah, world is 50-50 everything? We're talking about creativity. I'm not, yeah, we, we, we could, we, there'd be more conversation if we were talking about things that involve physicality, which is a clear difference between the male and female sex. I, I, I'm sure there's some interesting statistics around the, the amount you get paid, the amount of risk there is for a man in comparison to a woman. This, this is talking about intellect. We're talking like creativity, something that is not exclusive to any gender or any person. So I just need to know why there wasn't a difference. Well, I mean, you know, I don't think there's ever going to be a 50-50 kind of split in any kind of creative industry due to the bell curves. And so, you know, you have more 
male idiots and more male geniuses, and they're always going to be overrepresented at either end of that. No, that's intele- you're t- again, that's in- I-, I hear you on that. I also know that's sadistic, but I'm talking about creativity. I'm not talking, you don't have to be a genius to write a film or, or to, to, to direct it. It's uh, the, what, the a creative genius is a, th- is a thing, you know, and the fact that there are these women who are now making these films suggests that where I, I, I agree that there was probably a glass ceiling, you know, maybe even when we were kids, but now it suggests that that glass ceiling is no longer there, you know, and the kind of democratization of technology as well. Actually, you might say that it's a sticky floor, not a glass ceiling, because those women are having to stay at home and to take care of the kids. And <laughs> As a woman who stayed at home to take care of her kids from between the ages of like 20 and 30, I, I wasn't made to do that. It was a joy and I'm very glad that I made that decision and I think a lot of women are and more women than men generally. Okay, great. Oh, sorry. sorry just so a quick I, comment I and then we'll one to the more next point question. Just around um, the kind of hypergamy thing. Mm. Um, just from, from personal experience, I don't want to be too specific because I, I shouldn't really, but I, I've done you know, emotional, tra- uh, emotional trauma retreats and stuff in, in a search for my own kind of harmony or, or emotional balance. And, like, <laughs> the amount of women there who are in that economic structure you speak of, where there are men who have become incredibly successful businessmen, perhaps CEOs, <coughs> travelling the world, and their roles are very clear-cut, they're fucking miserable. And I think this whole time, a lot of women, not all women, but a lot of women have been miserable. I think there's stories of <laughs> women having various techniques on, on, on letting the day pass. But this idea of, um, of a man what, going to work and earning enough money and that being, that being a role in a set thing, and that's leading to a, har- a harmonious existence, I just don't think it's true anymore. I, I just think that, I, I genuinely think we've moved past that as a species. But I certainly yeah, like, wish yeah. we could move past it, but the stats don't show that. Like, I'm not saying hypergamy is good thing. I'm not, I'm not saying hypergamy uh, is... Can we move yeah. on to the next question now, otherwise we're not going to have time to go through this. So I think we've got everyone's opinions, and if we want to go back to this subject, the audience can ask some questions. Um, so my next question is um, specifically for the men's rights activists. So it's, what is your response to international feminism, particularly in countries where there is still a mass legal divide as well as social divide between the sexes, when girls are shamed when menstruating or are deprived of education due to being a girl? Is there not a need for feminism to fight for the rights of those girls and women? Uh, just like you know, the first and second wave of feminism in the Western world, there are legitimate women's issues. What I don't think we need is a movement that demonises women's closest allies, who are men, and minimises the disadvantages that they face. So, no thank you, no feminism for me. <laughs> um, I hate to delve into the area of what a boundary because we can always find a worse issue to focus on. The fact that there are more important issues elsewhere in the world doesn't mean that there aren't important issues close to home. So I wouldn't criticise feminism for you know, not focusing on a worse problem elsewhere in the world. Um, we don't want to race to the bottom. I do feel that we both, or we all, have a general tendency to have a focus problem. For example, there has literally been a cyclone in Mozambique that has killed thousands, and no one hears anything about it. There is a need for egalitarianism and a fight for equal rights uh, for all. I don't see the need for the gynocentric focus, though. I do feel that feminist focus should be uh, perhaps there where it's more extreme rather than engineering equal outcome for the freely made career choices of women in the West. However, in the Western world, when a genuine feminist hero like Ayan Hirsi Ali, who survived female genital mutilation and speaks out about the way in which Islamism abuses women, she is roundly criticized by intersectional feminists. Linda Sarsour, leader of the Women's March, which is about as close to a formal speaker for feminism as we can pin down, had this to say about Ayan Hirsi Ali. She's asking for an ass whooping. I wish I could take her vagina away. She doesn't deserve to be a woman. Radio silence from feminists and other organizers of the Women's March. So perhaps there is a focus issue here. Um, I think it's absolutely shocking that you would say 
feminism uh, is not for you when you, there are literally 32 million girls of primary school age and 29 million girls of lower secondary school age that are not getting an education around the world. Try telling an, the 11-year-old victim of rape and incest in Argentina that was denied an abortion and forced to carry to term an inviolable baby that died shortly after it, it was born that feminism is not for her. Try telling Ma Malala, who literally was shot for campaigning for girls to go to school in Pakistan, that the world doesn't need feminism. These, and, but these issues are not restricted to other parts of the world. They're still here in the UK. You, it, it, you mentioned in, in the question that girls are being shamed for menstruating. Well, as I said before, that it was only mandated this, this past month that um, schools in the UK should, should teach menstrual health. Um, so th this has had catastrophic consequences, not only for girls around the world, but also for girls suffering here in the UK uh, from menstrual disorders such as endometriosis. Women in, in the Western society have the right to vote, have access to education and contraception, and but that is due to the hard work of feminists. This cannot be taken for granted here or around the world because there's still a lot of work that's still left to be done. Um, actually, cool, I was going to say. Uh, oh, yeah. What were you talking about with the cyclone? So there's been a cyclone that's killed thousands of people in Mozambique, but our focus isn't on that. We okay. can kind of sensationalize other issues. Well, when you say a, a focus, do you, do you mean do you mean that a natural disaster has affected people? Yeah, there's attention. What could we do to change natural disasters affecting people? Uh, not much, but it's a, it's in terms of attention and sympathy. So what's the attention instead to people being killed by other people? I, I don't. Where's the attention? I don't understand why that's why there's anything to do with feminism's focus. No, but as in, I speak about a general focus for us to tendency to hype up things that are closer to home rather than farther away. Just in general. Not, I don't think feminism think should be held to account for not being able to solve a cyclone. Yeah, I think, I think like, um, in terms of international feminism, uh, I think it's really important because, like I say, um, there have been gender roles that have evolved over time that have been based off of principles and environments that have changed dramatically um, and I think it's time for us to move away from a lot of these patterns you know collective memory an idea of how to be with each other I believe can be altered I don't really have this defeatist idea that men are just people who run around and kill people and abuse people and that's just something we have to learn to manage I actually feel as though there's a real answer to that if we were all willing to to look at the root behavior and um, the ability to express emotion. I, I, I know. I just really believe that that's that's a, the whole world's problem. I'm not. I just. I find it difficult to understand how there's a redirection of priority when the large proportion of statistics around abuse, mass killings, and violence are still held by men, including on themselves. There's definitely a problem there. So I don't know what the deflection would be because. I don't know about any, I don't know about, I don't know of any mass scenarios where men have to worry for their physical safety at the hands of women directly. I don't know about that. And if you want to tell me about that place, then by God, I will stand beside the men. But I don't know of that place. I know of plenty of places where the vulnerability, the physical vulnerability, the emotional vulnerability of women is taken advantage of for some materialistic consumerist, fucking capitalist agenda, and why wouldn't we fight for that? I don't understand. Okay, thank you. Um, so, on to the next question. Um, so, this is sort of mainly aimed towards, we'll start off with the feminists. Um, so, regarding the broad spectrum of feminism um, and the individual beliefs in that, are there too many disagreements on what the feminist movement should stand for? Uh, I know that there is a lot of... Um yeah, there's a lot of uh, intersection going on. There's a lot of argument. I, I do understand, uh, you know, you quoted, actually, my friend Shadira. Um, she definitely said something very brash um, recently. And it's led to her becoming under fire from men and women, feminists. Um, I spoke to her myself. And, um, yeah, you know, she has to learn from that. I think I could definitely... 
understand there being extremes to feminism because anger is a, a core emotion that does need to find its place. I don't agree with it, but I'm definitely not going to sit here and, and, and be outraged by anger when I've witnessed complicity in, in the same kind of issues. You know, like I, I, if you were to, the fact that there's such outrage objectively about, about brush remarks around suicide, and yet as a, as a young man, as a man, I see people complicit in the culture that generates those statistics in the first place, and there isn't enough outrage headed that way either. Um, although, of course, she did fuck up, so. Uh, um, I, do, I, I, I personally have no, no idea about what, what that means going forwards. I think all ideas need to be challenged, all ideas should be thought through, critiqued, evolve, develop. Getting things wrong is a really, really important part of invention. So I think naturally there's going to be some disagreement. It would be really weird if everyone just agreed straight away about everything. Um, but I actually, no, the more we have this conversation, I'm thinking, I want to make my own branch, to be honest, because like, also, firstly, the word wave is wicked. Like, I don't know what wave you are. <laughs> but I want to make like, some new way, or like, I don't know. But um, I definitely want to back some, some element of it. Ultimately, I think we're heading to the same goal, which is um, everyone being a little bit more understanding of, of each other's feelings. That's why it's true. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to get killed by robots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely think that there's different um, er er areas of feminism. There's, of course, radical feminists, and then there's liberal feminists. Um, but oftentimes, it, it, it's the radical feminists that get the most airtime, and um, it's oftentimes the men's rights activists referring to the radical feminists as the representation of all feminists. But it's, it, there's many different opinions within feminism, and you've just seen that there's di different opinions between me and my partner, but we all have the same goal. Um, so, uh, but you know, radical feminists are, are oftentimes the ones that are protesting. They're grabbing headlines, but liberal feminists uh, tend to take a more less dramatic approach um, through perhaps legislative or legal means. Um, that, but they uh, emphasize the equality between men and women. Um, the, uh, it, it's I would identify as as a liberal feminist, um, but. Uh, it's like when I was in university. I was part of the International Socialist Organization, but I got sick and tired of protesting to deaf ears, so I joined the Democratic Party of Georgia, and I was able to bring about real change through legislative means, uh, but I, wa I didn't have to change my political views to do that. Um, so, but at the end of the day, it's very important to understand the definition of feminist in the Oxford English Dictionary. Feminist is an advocate for social, political, legal, and economic rights for women to equal those of men. Who here would not argue for that? Thank you. Um, any comment from this side? Which rights are they in the Western world? Sorry? Which rights are they that feminism is still necessary to campaign for in the Western world? So uh, tax on tampons until last year. Mm -hmm. There's a tax on toilet rolls. Yeah, but yeah, but that, that doesn't toilet, affect. A toilet roll and a tampon as well. Yeah, that doesn't affect men. <laughs> They're both necessities. Well, the necessity for one gender. The the fact that there's a there's a there's a government legislation that overlooked the fact you're getting you're having to pay extra to be a woman as a with a tampon tax. There's nothing comparable to that for men, and no men stood up to that. It took a feminist campaign to change it. Okay, so now we've got rid of that or we will with Brexit. Is there anything else? <laughs> no, that's a yes. good example of legislation. Also, why are you ignoring the non-Western world as well? Feminism also helps well, non-Western women as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think it is going to help people long term to drive this wedge between the sexes and demonise men. You know, when you talked about education, according to UNICEF, the unschooled population is 50-50 boys and girls. So, no, but in 120 million not, uh, uneducated uh, primary school and secondary school girls, that is, I can guarantee you that around the world, the proportion of that for men or boys is much, much less because boys are prioritized when it comes to education around the rest of the world. Can I give just a brief example to kind of challenge back on that? Uh, we've all heard of Boko Haram, right? 
where they kidnapped loads of girls and there was massive outrage and uh, Michelle Obama made it her main campaign. That was awful and we had massive amount of sympathy for them and it was great. The reason there was no outrage about kidnapped boys or that boys didn't seem to be being kidnapped is because they were all killed. They were all dead. Mm -hmm. So the, in terms of equality, uh, men have been disposable throughout history. They're being sent off to war to die. We show value through sacrificing our lives. So yeah. I'm absolutely with you on a tampon tax and that's the level of pro progressiveness we're at and that's a good thing to be celebrated that we're right. alleviating from that uh, misery. I rate you on that and yeah, for sure. I definitely think that there needs to be a lot more attention towards the sacrificial element of men, but who did that? Who killed the men? Well, that's with the gynocentric focus on why we... No, why no, who, killed, who killed the men and kidnapped the women? Men, in terms of the... That's what confuses me about this. I've heard this, I've heard this argument before about uh, there have been incredibly honourable men who have fought other men, but I don't understand at what point that's being... But why is history framed as privileging men then? I, why is it framed as patriarchy has ruled the roost and sacrifice men, but it's favouring men? Because it's Isn't also it? men, it's very difficult to, to argue a point when men are the attackers and the victims. It's very difficult to dissect that. If you had a different term for like men who were going to abuse men and women, then maybe we could do something a little fairer. But similarly in history, maybe because of the difference in physicality or power or, or paradigm, a lot of the stories have been written in a way that, is, that does exclude other men and women. I, I, I remember I studied the history of medicine, for example, at school, and not once did they mention this woman called Henrietta Lacks, which is, uh, I think the story is coming out about her now. She's a black woman who died of cervical cancer in 1957. She had a fucking immortal cell. She had a cell in her body that wouldn't die, right? They cloned it to a point where there's about $4 billion worth of these cells. She, her cells cured polio. I didn't have one fucking idea who this woman was until last year. And the question is, why? Why didn't I know that? Why didn't I know that? If we were in a society that was fairly distributing the people who have, who have contributed to it, why has no one ever heard of Henrietta Lacks? So you're, you're comparing, I agree with you, I wish I'd heard about her, it sounds amazing. No, she's amazing. Um, but you're comparing the sacrifice of men's lives in the millions with us not having enough of uh, a legend of folklore about a remarkable woman. It's not a folklore, I'm not, no, not, I'm in, not doing it instead of. She's a genuine legend, but I mean... We I believe you, I actually, I'm, I actually totally agree with you about this. I, I, watched a, I recently watched a documentary about World War One and Two, and I, I, like, I, I don't think there's enough understanding of the amount of pressure, the, the age that boys were pushed into that situation. And also, a lot of these guys were representative of a type of, of what I believe to be a true masculinity, they're incredibly emotive, some of the best poetry we've ever written has come out of the trenches. But that still doesn't change the fact that it's because, so, like, it's th that one of these wars is because someone got fucking thrown out of art school. Like, it is, there's, <laughs> like, that's, that's, that, that doesn't, you can't check, you know what I mean, you can't, I wish, I, I definitely think there should be more space to really truly honour the men who have stood up against other men. But I don't think it's like, female centric to, to, I don't, I don't know, to, to just, overlook the reality that these things were also pers um, persecuted by men in the first place. I think this uh, moves on to sort of the next question I have um, quite well. It's sort of, um, if you're posing feminism as an attack on men, then is men's rights an attack on women? Can each movement not coexist with each other? Um, you know, I, I defy anyone here to find a quote from a prominent leader in the men's rights movement that argues for women to be treated less favorably than men but you know as far as the feminist movement goes they do it routinely um, you know we've mentioned quotas we've mentioned the criminal justice system we've mentioned family courts all of which feminists have campaigned for privileges for women and discrimination for men um, having said that you know Obviously, feminism's here and it's not going away, and I'm aware that, you know, I'm going to have to coexist with them. Um, but I think they need to learn that they're going to have to coexist with us. At the moment, feminists hold all the institutional power and they silence our voices. <laughs> I would just add that uh, I'm relatively new to the men's rights movement. Um, and when we both joined, Lizzie stood up and made comments and was articles written about her for 
uh, honoring her, saying, you know, she was the first feminist to ever humanize us and to break bread with us and all this. Women have been welcomed into the men's rights movement and play a central part in it. Uh, men love women, absolutely, and women are absolutely welcome in the men's rights movement. It's not exclusive at all. Um, and yeah, that's just, a, you're an example of it yourself. Okay, so um, as we've seen today, uh, my opponents, um, uh, with my opponents, many men's rights activists blame all issues that face men on feminism because apparently we hold all the power. <laughs> uh, they don't blame the family court systems that take away their children. They don't blame the parents that circumcise their children. They blame feminists. Uh, but the solution to men's issues is not to place more blame on women for hosting their own culture of evolution. The solution is to have a masculinity movement that redefines what it is to be a man. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> so I think maybe where we can bridge something here is that um, I do think that there's potentially it's a little far of a reach to assume that masculinity until this point hasn't been positive. Um, but I do believe that it's the responsibility of men to find the stories and um, push the culture of masculinity that's positive for everyone. Because, like I say, I, I, I do believe, like a pendulum, a lot of these movements will go extreme there and extreme there, and it's all a process, and we're all growing, we're all learning. But I think it's, it's, it's kind of bizarre to, to assume that like, um, there, isn't, there isn't a lack of... Like, why would, we, why would people be fighting for equality if it, if it existed? Do you know what I mean? I don't, I, it, there's not, it's, I don't think there's, from my understanding, my belief in feminism isn't to, to maintain the same power structure and then use that in reverse. I think it's just fighting for um, a, certain, a certain sector of the world to just be looked at as a human being. And, and, then, and then also, I think what a, lot of these, a lot of the movements seeming threatening is interesting to me because if you take the civil rights movement, for example, it's very triggering the word free speech because you could argue that there would be loads of people who have been brought up with collective memory, who have an understanding of other, and there will be institutions in America that would not allow certain people into their spaces and would maybe talk to them in a certain way. Now, for there to be legislation to alter the discourse around a certain group of people because people didn't know what was respectful, I wouldn't say that was discriminating against white people. I'd say that would be actively helping people who were disadvantaged. So I think there needs to be a clear line between those two because there are some aspects of, of life that we can go through. And also as men, we don't even realize it without listening that there needs to be some things that will feel a little bit triggering for a while because we're so fucking used to it. It's gonna be uncomfortable allowing there to be space to be for people to be seen as equals. So that leads on, um, it's sort of a similar kind of question. Um, it's sort of, does hatred towards the male or the white male in some sort of feminist circles focus too much on tearing men down rather than focusing on pushing women forward? Yeah, probably. Um, I definitely do think that, like, this, I don't know, my experience of intersectionality is, is wild, like, it is, it is a bit of a minefield. Um, I think it, there's, there's, we're in a transitional, pro we're in a transitional phase where voices that were previously silenced or, or thrown to the side are, are, are actively collecting in groups via the internet and realising that they're not alone and realising that they're not leaving to hide. And I think it's a little bit much for us to expect some of these groups to not be a bit pissed off, like, um, and I don't, ag I don't agree with it. I don't think it's that. I don't think anger as, as a driving force for a prolonged period of time will ever bring about real change. But I definitely think it's an imperative part of breaking through, um, a pers like a continuous sense of, I don't know, like feeling beaten, feeling defeated. You have to drive yourself out of it some somehow. Um, in terms of the whole white male thing, look, like I say, there's going to be a little bit of backlash. But I know for a fact, like I say, if I'm talking about about history, I went to school, um, and you wouldn't believe it, I did. And I remember leaving thinking that the white man literally did everything. They invented everything. They won everything. They're just the best, just constantly. And I'm not saying that there are not loads of examples of, of that being very, very true, but 
I don't want to spoil the end and know one thing about colonialism. I don't know one thing about about the, the reason as to why our country is our country, the reason why I eat my food, the reason why I'm here. I think it talk about one rush. I think I won't talk about none of that. It's a nationalist history. And I've actually done a thing around media bias towards refugees. This happens all across Europe. They have nationalist history. And you wonder why there's such discrimination against against other. Because they don't even know. You go to Spain, some of the issues of racism in Spain is outrageous. They don't even know that it used to be in our country. They have no idea. They just look at it and go, you look, this is our country. It's not the country. Do you know what I mean? So these situations in terms of the white male, it is frustrating because they seem to have written a lot of what we learn to be the truth when actually I think the stories are very different. Um, but yeah, I don't agree with like Kenny and anyone as a person because I'd hate my own mum if I really got into it and she's lovely, you know what I mean? I'm not annoyed with the white side of me, as you say. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that you brought up a lot of really interesting points. Uh, I mean, I grew up in America, and I was at the, in America, you're not taught anything about colonialism. You actually celebrate Columbus Day um, when a, less than 1% of the American population today is Native American. Just think about that. So the Native American population, there was a mass genocide for Native American population, but you don't, you're not taught that in schools. So I think it's very important that we talk about the different issues that are facing different uh, areas of society, not only in history, but that are facing those, those um, ethnic groups today. And um, if feminism does bring that up. Like, uh, for example, I'm, I'm a Latina woman, and in America, I would make 54% of what, a, of what a man would make, a white man would make. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, that the wage gap simply reflects women performing different jobs for different, um, uh, different jobs than their male counterparts. However, various studies have shown that that's actually not true. For example, women are paid less than men for the same jobs in the food industry. Now, the, uh, it's, it also uh, affects other ethnic groups, such as uh, black women in America are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than white women. Now, these are very important statistics because we have to remember that they just don't affect white men. Um, so it wouldn't, it, it, feminists want to bring these issues to light because they affect people. So, I, I mean, I, I just don't hear that kind of discourse from men's rights activists. Do you have any comments on that question? I mean, just very briefly, ultimately, you'll never run out of categorize, uh, categories to categorize people under. Uh, we have to return to judging people on individual identity over group identity. Um, you know, that, that just has to be the starting point on which we build uh, our future. Uh, prejudicing against any group on immutable characteristics is just a race to the bottom. You're never gonna, it's never gonna lead anywhere. Uh, just returning to feminism, uh, there seems to be a bit of a no true Scotsman kind of fallacy at play whereby anything bad is considered, oh, it's not really feminism. But anything good that feminism does that's considered good is like, yes, queen, feminism, that's, that works. Like, it's just, it doesn't, <laughs> sorry, it doesn't. <laughs> I just never see, I was really refreshed to hear you actually criticise uh, what your, your friend said uh, about this. Well, I just thought about because, you know, it is, you have to have a genuine, uh, like I say, we're all on a path, we all get things wrong and, and we try and learn through discourse, that's why I'm here. Absolutely. Here we go. And it's worth ending for the girls for the audience. It's alright, yeah. So, has anyone got any questions? You've got to raise your hands and I'll go.